of the Spirit of the Lord. It's so very precious. You know, when the Lord touched me, there's the language of love in silence. And when the, he did touch me for hours, I would sit in his presence and nothing was said. I want to share my testimony with you. And I'm going to, um, I asked the Lord what I should uh, speak today about. I've been praying about it and he told me a long time ago to share the revi uh, revival story somewhat. And so I get to do part of another message that I had on my heart. So we compromised. <laughs> But I don't know why he wants the story told, but he does. And uh, I know that you're going to be blessed by it because God doesn't make a mistake. And I'm going to do my very best because I've got Verl's cloth here. <laughs> she gave me this. And so I'm going to just ask God to let that anointing that's on her come on me today, too. <clears throat> You know, you're here because you're a God chaser, right? Well, I am too. And I have not read uh, Brother Tenney's book, but I hear it's just awesome and wonderful. So anything I say today is not because I've read his book, but it's because we serve the same God. I want to pray. Father God, I thank you for your presence. Lord, I love your presence. We love to be with you, Lord. Just be so close to our hearts right now. And let the Spirit of the Lord speak into the hearts and in the ears of these sweet ladies. Father, I just give you myself today, a vessel that you can pour out. Have your way, Father. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, we at Brownsville... We're pursuing God for two and a half years. My husband was weary and tired, and he was really seeking the Lord, and he said, Lord, there's just got to be more. And he was almost burnt out because being a pastor sometimes, people in the church kept bringing problems, and, and uh, they didn't want to change. They just, he didn't see much fruit. And they just get weary, and he had just come out of a building program, so he was really tired, and he just kept going after God. And he recall, recalls one night being on a pew, and he said, Lord, there's just got to be more. And he said, Son, keep going after me. And he would pray, and he would pray, and he'd go into the church and lock the doors so no one would hear him. And he would scream out to God at the top of his lungs, God, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. And the Lord told him one day in prayer, if you will go back to the God of your childhood and seek my face, he said, because his God of the childhood was prayer meetings every night for two years, and he even saw angels come into the church. It was an awesome time. And he said, if you will make my house the house of prayer, I will come with my glory. And so the Lord gave him the concept of 12 banners, and each of these had categories that we would gather around as a church and pray. There was souls banner, revival banner, schools, ministries, leader of our nation, uh, warfare, peace of Jerusalem, pastors, children, healing, ministries, and catastrophe. And we would begin our services on Sunday night. He did away with preaching. He thought he would lose his crowd, but he didn't. The people came to pray. You see, people don't know how to pray for one thing, like they should. And so these categories, the Lord knows, and these were just focuses that people could stay focused on what to pray about. And being so busy, and both parents most work today, and, you know, they're so stressed out with homework and all the work that they have to do, they enjoyed coming in and praying. They felt good about that. 
So we would begin our worship, and it would be awesome. And then we would go around the banners, and we would pray about an hour around the different banners. And then we would take communion as we learned what communion meant. And then my husband would speak a blessing over the people, and they would go home. But as we continued on in this for two and a half years, it was so awesome. The people began to linger. And they would tell our music leaders, said, sing another song. And so the people that had to leave would go on home, but a majority of the people would stay, and they would just worship again. And it became, it became like a, a family. And the children would even come and sit on my husband's lap. And it was really an awesome time. And the love of the people were just, we were, it was growing, and we felt so close to one another, and it was truly a family. <clears throat> well, during this time, my husband's mother had got sick. She had taken cancer, and uh, I would go every day, and I would stay there, and I would take care of her. I almost quit going to church because she was my project. She was 84 years old and I wanted to take care of her. She had mentored me and, and lived with us for 10 years and helped me bring my children up and taught me how to cook, and she was a wonderful person. And so I stayed with her as much as I could, and, and uh, one day someone called my husband and told him about how God had sent, you know, was the outpouring in Toronto. So he said, I'll stay with Mother, and you go up and check it out. So I had the privilege of going to Toronto and I didn't know what to expect. I took my friend Cheryl Seidler, and uh, we flew up. And when we got there, being Pentecostal, we did not worship in the same way they did. We, we worshiped, but they, they had banners. They ran through the aisles and danced, and, and we didn't do much of that. You know, most people in, in the church that uh, my husband would see dance didn't live the life. They'd sleep around, and so he'd go tell the ushers, so t tell them to take a seat. So uh, I guess the other people just thought it, uh, dancing wasn't allowed, but that wasn't true because we came out of a church that did dance somewhat. But anyway, we went up there and didn't know what to expect, but they were all just dancing and, and worshiping the Lord and even the young people. It was so neat how the young people were jumping up and down. And you know, when young people do that, it's really something. But uh, I just, you know, I, I just sensed that God was there, but, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if it was going to be a Benny Hinn thing, that he was going to come and someone was going to do their hand and everybody go out. I didn't know what to expect. I'd never been around anything like that, but I enjoyed it so much. And I was so tired, I thought. I didn't really know what was going on, but I got real sleepy. Just, I mean, real sleepy, and I thought, well, it was because of the early flight that morning. And so I just put my head up on the chair in front of me, and I said, well, nobody knows me here, so it really won't matter. But what I didn't know was that was the glory that was coming on me. I couldn't explain. I heard every word that was said, but I just couldn't keep my head up. It was so strong. And so, you know, it didn't make sense. And I said, well, you know, let's go back to the motel because I want to be fresh before the Lord. I don't want to give him, you know, sleepiness like this. I didn't understand the glory. So we went back, and we came back the next night. And it was, you know, about like it was the night before, and the worship was wonderful and all that. Didn't know the words, couldn't read. It was so far off. So I couldn't really enter in even to that. And then they had this other pastor that was just there, a visiting pastor preaching, and, and really he, he was kind of boring. And I said, dear God, if you're in this place, you better come because I don't feel a thing, you know. And this is my last chance. So I went and I stood on the line, and they do it better than we do at Brownsville. If you come, you've really got to have faith to come to Brownsville. But uh, they line you up on a line, and they come by, and the workers, and they pray with you. Well, this little lady came by, and I don't even remember what she looked like. She was just a plain little girl, plain looking with long hair. I do remember that. And she said, what do you need? And I said, well, I'm here for a refreshing. I'm a pastor's wife and just need a fresh touch, you know, just whatever. I didn't really know what God was going to do for me. And so she didn't even touch me, but she just began to pray. And all of a sudden, I felt this hot 
intense fire come on the top of my head and it stopped at my neck and my toes went up and I <laughs> I found out later, uh, ladies, that's a sign of intimacy. <laughs> but, in <laughs> but anyway, I braced myself because I was going to make sure this was God, you know. No courtesy falls, you know how that goes. And as I did, I went out. And my friend Cheryl said that I was out about 45 minutes. And I laid there that long on my back, which I could not have done that because I had a, a bad back, and the Lord healed me. When I tried to get up, I was so drunk, I couldn't get up. I'd never experienced that before. And so I just had to sit there and see what was going on. And beside me lay this large lady. She had a, you know, kind of a big stomach, and her stomach began to shake like jello. <laughs> and then her stomach would stop, and then she would make the moans, oh, oh, and then that would subside, and her stomach would start up again. Well, you know, I'm looking over here, and that was kind of weird to me. <laughs> But I knew God was doing something, healing her, giving her inner healing. I didn't know, but I knew he was healing something in her stomach. And then over to my left, I heard a young girl in her early 20s, and she would holler out, No! No! And I knew that she had been violated as a young girl. And for the first time, she was, there was a release that was coming that she could say no and a healing had begun. I just knew that in my spirit. I heard the laughter. I saw a lot of things, but I noticed this one man, and he was doing this. Now, you know, to me, people can really get down on manifestations. But, you know, when the crippled and the... the the ones that were around the pool of Bethesda was sitting around the pool. What happened? Would an angel come and wouldn't it stir in the waters? And wouldn't the people, when they saw that, a manifestation of God's presence, that they'd jump in and whoever jumped in would be healed? To me, that's what a manifestation is. It's just a sign and a wonder that God's in the house. And you know, it really is the very thing that spurred revival that got everybody's attention because we were shaking and jerking. But it wasn't only that, it was because we were changed when we got up off the floor. But anyway, I, we, it was wonderful, you know, and, and I really didn't know what God had done for me. We went home, and my husband wanted Cheryl and I to get up and share what had happened about, and tell about the revival in Toronto. And Cheryl and I was smart enough to say, well, we are not going to mention anything about the manifestations that we saw. We didn't even know to call them manifestations. manifestations. And so we said, you know, because people are copycats, and if they see it, they'll copy what you do. We said, if God wants to do that at Brownsville, he can do it, but we're not going to tell anybody. Makes sense, doesn't it? And so we went back home, and she and I got up and told how that 3,000 people from all over the world was coming there and just being touched by God and told about some awesome testimonies and, and how that God was in the house. And everybody was real excited because, you know, we had been praying for God and revival to just show up at Brownsville, so that was just something that we loved. Well, that morning we got up and we were just praising the Lord, and uh, then my husband began to preach. But over to the right-hand side of the church, there was a lady that stood the whole time my husband preached, and she did this. Her name is Georgia, and she used to be a barmaid, and she had just been saved a year, and she did that. She couldn't have known anything about that stuff, and that was a sign to me. And later I found out that Hazel... Uh, Benny is here. He's playing on the guitar. But his wife, Hazel, she's pregnant. She's always pregnant. She's got nine kids. 
it's really funny because it's like somebody's got to be pregnant on that platform and her sister Carol's here pregnant this time and uh, she's just had her ninth child so she couldn't be with us but uh, we just have fertile ground at Brownsville for sure <laughs> but uh, where was I lost my thought I'm over 40 oh and so that so excited me when I saw Georgia doing her hands like that. Oh, I couldn't talk to Cheryl. She was way off. I couldn't even see her, you know. And I was so, oh, I just had to talk to somebody because I'm a single and I like to talk. And so I just got my little pen and paper out and I began to write Holy Spirit a note. And I said, oh, Holy Spirit, you're here just like you are in Toronto. I said, please come to Brownsville and send revival. Make us hungry like Georgia. And so my husband went on, we'd gone preaching and, and just excited that God was going to move. I began to notice a change in my life. You see, as a pastor's wife, I came into the ministry with a lot of hurts as a young girl. And only to go into the ministry to be wounded some more, not having any mentor in my life. I never had prophets around me that would speak words to me. All of our life until Brownsville, we had very few prophets come and give us a word. So I didn't know about all that stuff. And everything, you know, there's so much jealousy in the church, even among the pastors and their wives, that we could have no fellowship. It seemed like we didn't think we were that bad of people, but it just seemed like every church we went to, there was jealousy there, and we, couldn't, we didn't have any pastor friends. So I was hurting, and I had, saw a lot of junk in the church, and I'm not going to tell you my war stories, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of walls that went up. But it really drove me to the Lord, drove me into His Word, and I had a, uh, I had a relationship with Him. I loved His Word. And I would pray, and but there was like a claw in my brain. I couldn't have a breakthrough. I didn't know there was just feelings of unworthiness. Just these feelings would come out of nowhere. And I would just feel, what's wrong, Lord? Lord, if you'll show me, I'll repent. I would just cry to the Lord. I'd say, God, I know there's something in my life, but if you'll just show me, I don't know what it is. But, you know, it kept me in a state of brokenness. And I wasn't like that every day. You know, I had joy, but I just, there was more. And I felt like there was something wrong with me. And I, it drove me to the Lord to just stay so pure and try to find out what it is. And really, you know, I guess I was really doing works, trying to get God's grace. And, and, and I didn't understand the grace of God because I, I didn't have that. And so I was struggling as a pastor's wife, and I knew all the scriptures. I used to get into that confession, and, and, and that works too, but it wasn't working for me. I did not know how to apply it to my life. You know, it, sometimes all that can be is head knowledge too, and it's got to be in the heart. And so I really struggled, but I began to notice when I came back that I was free couldn't believe it because I had lived like that for years and I knew I was not free but who could I tell the church people when they looked at me they expected me to be the powerhouse you know but pastors wives are people too and you know the devil uses they're his target because if they can hit her they can distract the man of God where she can't stand shoulder to shoulder with him behind that platform but I loved people and that helped me a lot in the ministry I've never had church problems I've never had people I've only had one encounter with a lady and all I do, wanted to do was just love people I mean I like people and so it was easy for me one-on-one -on -one to be a pastor's wife but to get up like I'm doing now I didn't like that I was not comfortable at all and I was content to sit on my pew but anyway, <clears throat> I began to notice the change. And you know, many of us get up and we offer prayer. We offer ourselves to the Lord and we begin our Bible studies every morning. But this was different. 
instead of offering it to the Lord, I was drawn in. It was different this time. It was a joy. It was an anticipation that something, somebody was going to meet me there. And I was being drawn in. And I never knew you. You could have that relationship like that with God. But he had just took that claw out of my brain and he changed my world. He brought me in. And now I couldn't believe it. I had prayed all these years, God, if you'll show me what's wrong. I'll repent. What is it, Lord? What is it, Lord? Do you know the gratitude that I had for him? Do you know what whelmed up in my spirit? Tears of gratitude. Such love that I had for him. Because I would say, God, I know you can do anything. Why don't you touch me? Why don't you change me? And no answer. He was silent with me all those years. But then he's touching me now. And tears, floods, rivers of tears were just coming. And do you know I would sit in his presence for hours weeping with love and gratitude of what he had done for me. Oh, I know what Hannah must have felt when God gave her a child, Samuel, because God had touched me, and I was forever changed. I was like a tea bag, I say, in a teapot, and he was just pouring in on me. And I would just feel waves of his glory come. And it was just such an awesome time. And my husband, he saw the change in me. And I forgot about housework. <laughs> Revival has got me out of a lot of cooking, girls. <laughs> but I forgot about that. I, I managed somehow, I know. But my children were grown, so it was okay. But I love the Lord so much. And I, the word became alive in my spirit. It was so wonderful. I began to worship and dance as I never had before. You do somewhat, but when you're free, you really dance. My husband would come home and he would catch me dancing through the house. You know, the river of God was my favorite song. And Cheryl Seitler had somehow gotten me the tapes from the vineyard tapes. And, oh, man, that's all I needed. I was off and going with the Lord. And I began to sneak in and talk to Benny. Benny's here. Where are you, Benny? I don't know if he's in here, but I used to sneak in his office, and I'd talk to him about what the Lord had done for me. Oh, and Benny would get so mad if anybody would come in the office, you know, so he'd get up and he'd shut the door and he'd just sit there. You could see the tears come out of his eyes because he longed for that too. And the staff began to be in touch and, and they decided they would go to Toronto and they came back and they were touched too. My husband tried to go, but he couldn't. Uh, on the way up there, the enemy came against him and uh, they thought he was having a hard time. They let him go, so but we couldn't go. We sent them on. I began to know what it was for a time. I don't live in that realm like I did, but I promise you, I lived in a realm for four months that I knew what it was to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. My mind was on him in waking and sleeping. The power of God was just on me, and, and I could, it was like I was sleeping, but I was awake unto the things of God. I can't tell you how it was. It was like a, uh, an aurora in my bed. It was just a, a, that would come off of my body, and it was so awesome in those days. And uh, I lived in that realm, and I'm not so sure that that, I, I knew what it was to enter into God's rest free from anxiety, free from worry and fretful stuff. I walked in that, and it was wonderful. And I believe, even as we enter 
the year 2000, I wonder if the Lord's got that for us. You know, the lease will be up in t at 2000, and it goes back to God. I believe we're coming into something new that God's going to give us, and I wonder, oh, how I wish that God would let his people walk in that. Because, see, when you walk in that, whoa, whoa, it'll change your life. The joy will carry you through any problem. The peace that comes, because it was the kingdom of God that I experienced. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It was mine. And I wonder if that's what God's going to let us do, is enter into that rest. You know what? It will set us on fire. You'll be able to talk to your neighbor and witness because you can't stand not to. I would go into shopping centers, be so excited, and I'd just ask them about the Lord, where I was timid before. Do you know the Lord? It's awesome. I just had an encounter with a young man on an airplane that was in South Africa that I met on the airplane, and I told him about Brownsville, and he was going to Miami. I said, well, if it doesn't work out, why don't you try Brownsville? Because God's got a plan for your life. The young man came to Browns who was saved and being mentored by my nephew. Isn't it awesome? It was so wonderful, and there began to be a, a joy and anticipation even in Brownsville because now our staff, we'd come on, we'd go to our back porch, and the staff would get out there, and we'd pray for one another, and everybody would fall out, and it was so much fun. We'd laugh. We'd had such a good time. And, but we were trying to keep it quiet, you know, around Browns, but because we wanted it to be God. If it came, it was going to be a God thing. We were not going to make anything happen. So I remember going into prayer meeting one Thursday morning. We're getting late here. Do we, we, we'll just forget lunch today. <laughs> I won't do that to you. I'll hurry. But... I began, you know, just the Lord was there, and we had Thursday uh, morning prayer meeting for the ladies, and so I would go in, and I was praying this one morning, and I got up, and I went to the restroom, and I saw Cheryl and Denise Tisdale, who's here, and uh, they were in the hall, and I said, hey, girls, come in here. I want to show you something the Lord showed me. I was so excited. I just got something from the Lord, and we went, and we sat down on the couch in the lounge, and all of a sudden, I read this scripture to them. And then I felt this wave of glory come over my head like this. And I said, oh, I feel the Lord. Well, I got just as drunk as I could be, and I shut my eyes and I bowed my head. I was like that for the next two hours. I didn't move. I couldn't move. Well, Denise, she hadn't been to Toronto, so she looks at Cheryl, I guess, and she says, What's, what is it? And Cheryl says, well, you know, ever since Brenda's been to Toronto, God's really touched her, and I believe he's got a plan for pastor and her. And I guess Denise said, okay. You kind of hear everything, but you can't respond. So they just kind of were talking about the Lord there. And then my husband came in, and he had never seen me like that. And so, you know, and he's a very much in control pastor. <laughs> and he comes in, and he pops open the door, and there I am, I guess, and he says, What's wrong with my wife? <laughs> and Cheryl began to explain what had happened. And he said, oh. And so they excused themselves because they had to go get their children at school. So my husband and I were sitting there on the couch, and I couldn't move. And he, he said, honey, uh, you all right? And I couldn't respond. He said, honey, I got a board meeting. Can you get out of this? And I really tried. I mean, I tried to open my eyes. I tried so hard for three days. My eyeballs were so sore. <laughs> but he, he began to get real spiritual, and he gave me a rub down. <laughs> he was thinking he's going to get some blood circulating, you know. <laughs> Mighty man of God. <laughs> but anyway, he began to. See, I wasn't budging. 
And all of a sudden, he just started laughing. He said, well, this must be God. <laughs> and so when he said that, it was so funny. And you know, when you have the holy laughter, anything can spur you off. Well, here I was, I'd never had the holy laughter before. And I mean, I just did this way out and, and I, I just started laughing. And when I did, I saw a big old donkey with its mouth wide open. <laughs> That donkey was me. <laughs> but I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. And then I turned back toward this way and I would cry and I would cry. This deep sobs. And then I would go back into the laughter and I was back and forth. I'd have loved to see my husband's face. <laughs> Well, he finally got me to the car, got me home. He put me on the couch. And he changed clothes and got ready for the board meeting. So he took me to Morrison's, didn't have time to cook. <laughs> and so we were sitting in Morrison's, and my husband's not one to cry unless the Lord really gets on him. And so... He was just sitting there. We were eating and drinking and talking about the Lord. And all of a sudden, he said, Brenda, had this have happened to anybody else in the church, I probably wouldn't have believed it. But because I know your life and I know what God's done for you, he said, I know God's going to send revival now. And before God and everybody, he just began to weep. I mean, bawl. Boo! <gasps> And any other time, I would have been embarrassed. Said, oh, please don't do that. But not me. I'm laughing at him because it's God. Well, we began to experience the glory I did at first. And then my husband, after revival broke, he got the glory on him. But it was awesome. And you know what the glory is? I'm sure all you know. But I'm going to tell some of the others that maybe have never heard what the glory is. You know, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, and it said that God came into the garden, and uh, they had hid themselves from him because they sinned. And he, they, he said, where are you, Adam? And he said, I'm uh, naked. He said, who told you you were naked? The reason he knew he was naked because glory, the kabod of God means weightiness. And it was on them, and they felt it was like clothes and an armor on them, even though they were naked. But when they sinned, the glory lifted off of them. And then they hunted for something to put and cover themselves up with. And that's what's happened to the church. We have lost the glory. It's departed. On Father's Day, Steve Hill came. He was a missionary evangelist friend of ours that had been mightily touched in this move of God. He was in England when he was touched in a Lutheran church. A Lutheran vicar prayed for him. You see, revival and refreshing is bringing the body of Christ together. It's true. God's going to get us together one way or the other. And we've been so dry and thirsty that we're willing to humble ourselves and go to a church that we don't like the title of. Not all's come, but they're coming in. Steve Hill came that day. My husband had just lost his mother five weeks. And he really was still down and having a hard time about it. He didn't, his heart just, he couldn't preach, his, his heart was hurting. He said, Steve, he was planned uh, to preach that night. He said, Steve, just preach Sunday morning. I just can't, don't have the heart to. And 
Steve began to preach, and if you've been there and you know Steve, he can't be still behind the pulpit. His feet are going up and down. He's antsy, you know. He said, God's going to touch you this morning, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, we've heard a thousand evangelists come through here. Big deal, you know, how church just accepts anything. And he was excited, and he just said, God's going to touch you today. And he began to tell us about the, in the old times how God touched his people in the old revivals, the Welch revival and all, and he would read things to us, and it was so exciting. And that morning, just maybe a hundred people came and got saved. And then he, him and my husband went off to the side of the platform that morning, and my husband was going to help him pray. And then my husband was thinking, dear Lord, Steve, it's Father's Day. These guys need to go and be with their fathers, you know? And uh, here we're going to pray for a thousand people, you know? And he didn't really want to pray. He was, you know, tired and weary. And so they go off, and, and the, he's just doing, he, he calls it his preacher thing, you know? You know? And so when he walked off the side, he heard a noise, like, I can't do it like he does. He does great sound effects. <laughs> but he heard, it's like the sound system above, and he looked up, and he heard this sound, and he knew it wasn't coming from there. But all of a sudden, it was one of those suddenlies. This, we call it like the river came into Brownsville in that very area where the, the Holy Spirit had touched Hazel over there. And uh, I forgot to tell you, she got touched that morning and fell out in the Spirit too. And another y young man that said he had saw something uh, so terrible as an eight-year-old child that he had never been able to cry. And that morning, he had cried for the first time. But anyway, so the, the river came in through his feet, his legs. It has to come through the leadership. You see, if the leader doesn't want this move of God in his church, the Lord is not going to move in because he won't go past the leadership. So that morning, his feet went out, his ankles went out, and he was just like this. And one of the young men saw him, and he said, Pastor, you need help? He said, yeah, help me on the platform. By the time he got from there to back on the platform, he knew what it was. He knew it was God. And he leaned up on the pulpit and he said, Folks, this is it. This is what we've been praying for for two and a half years. He said, Get in, get in. And of course, you know, that was the Father's Day outpouring. And isn't it interesting that God came on Father's Day? He wants to show his people, I'm a good father. Many of you here have been abused probably by your fathers, been violated, and the world's hurting, and, and the kids are on the street, and they've just been let go, and there's no one to love on them. But God says, I'll show you. I'm a good father. I have good things I want to give you. And so the church could not show what God was. He wanted to do more in the church, so he just showed up for himself. He's representing himself now, and he said, I'll show you what I want to do. And as you know, we've had over millions of people come through our doors, and over hundreds of thousands have been saved and been touched and changed. They don't only shake under the power of God, but they have been totally changed. So awesome. One of the... Go ahead. Give God the glory. I think one of the neatest stories that I've ever heard uh, that touched my heart more, it was a little black boy that was in the uh, baptismal pool. And he just touched my heart so much. And he gave his testimony and he said, I was a street person. And he said, I came to the revival. And he said, God touched me and changed my life. He said, I've been in and out. He said, I was... Uh, given away as a child. I've been in and out of foster homes and been abused all my life. So I just left and went to the streets. He said, but I came to the revival and he said, it's changed me. And I love Jesus so much. He said, I didn't know anybody. He said, so I went and I got a phone book and I just wanted to tell somebody about Jesus. And he said, I pointed my finger in the phone book, and my, I dialed the number, and I, a man answered, and he said, you don't know me. He said, but I want you to know I received Jesus Christ as my Savior tonight. And just so happened, it was a pastor. 
And the pastor now mentors that young man. Isn't God good? He knows where we are. He loves us. When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to have visitors because they'll come out. You know, we said if this revival's of God, we won't have to advertise it. We made up our mind. No advertisement. This is God's revival. He'll promote it himself, and he did. Because when the chain, people got up off the floors and they were changed, they went back and they told their friends that were drug addicts and whatever, and they brought them back. People have been healed of all kind of things. Recently, we've just had just a miracle begin, and we know God's going to mightily use our young people. Our, our children's church, our youth are just... They're past on fire. They're uh, ablaze. But uh, our little children, they in children's church, they have just church like we do, and they lay hands on each other and pray. They're prophesying now, and they're falling out. It's awesome how God's using the little children. But just a couple of weeks ago, I guess it's been, one of our little Royal Rangers, 10 years old, cutest kid, pastor brought him up, moved the flowers, and set him right in front of the pulpit, and so everybody could see and hear the testimony. He said, son, tell us what happened at one of the pizza places. And so he began to tell his story. They were in there eating, and the waitress came up, and she must have saw the uniform, knew they had been to church, said, well, what church do you go to? And they said, Brownsville Assembly. And she said, oh, well, you know, the paper tried to ruin us, so we've lost our reputation, and it feels really good. We have nothing to prove now, but uh, so when she walked off, there was another man, a sinner, that was sitting at another table, and he kind of struck up a conversation with him and was getting smart and said, well, how do you know that preacher's not taking all your money over there? Well, the little kid spoke up, and he said, I give my money to the church, and the preacher prays for me, and I believe he's okay. And he said, sir, do you want to receive Jesus in your heart? And the man said, yes, I do, son. Isn't that wonderful? And you know what happened? He began to pray for him, and as he laid hands on him, he felt the power of God come, go down his arm, go into the man. It came back up his arm. And the man started spitting up a tumor. He started bringing up, and he was stringing. He was just bringing out a tumor he had had. And he ran to the bathroom and finished cleaning himself up. And he came back, and he said, I've got a sternum. I've got a sternum. I didn't have one before. Isn't God wonderful? Signs and wonders and miracles. This little kid... He told this kid, and this people by then, everybody's excited, and he says, if I beat my chest and I don't pass out, I know I'm healed. So if I go out, I'll know, y'all just watch me. And he started beating his chest as hard as he could, and he didn't pass out. I mean, I want that guy's testimony in church. Isn't that awesome? Our little children. Well, you know, when revivals first broke out, I'm telling you, you talking about God chasers, Brownsville people. I can see why God showed up. Those people were so hungry for God. Now, we had a hundred leave. Those were the religious crowd. They couldn't get it. They didn't want their kids shaking. That pride just, they didn't want their children to be a part of that or themselves. It was too undignified. Well, that's okay. We bless them, and, and they've gone to other churches, and I pray we'll see them in heaven. But, no, I mean that. I mean, they'll be there. They'll be there. I prayed for them. But anyway, the presence of the Lord was so powerful in those first days. But God had to get our attention because we were the workers. We were the ones that immediately, uh, Jeannie and Bill got, and they got this prayer team going. And uh, Bill, uh, you talking about a change. Bill was real stoic and a quiet man, very faithful, you know. I'm sure he paid his tithes. I've never checked it, but he's just that kind of man. <laughs> he's just that kind of man, you know. You just knew he would. But the Lord so touched him, and, and he got the laughter. Now, that was not like Bill Bush, and he's here too. 
And so people would try to reach down. He wanted to get up off the floor, and, and the Lord wouldn't let nobody help him. Every time they reached over to get him, they'd start laughing. But I mean people that were just pew warmers that, you, you know, they were faithful. You just would not know what God would do in them. They jumped in the river. They were our very ones. And some of the deacons and the people that we thought would just love it left. So you can't second guess your people what they're going to do, but God knows the heart. And you know, a lot of people are divorced and in the church and, and they just have done things and they don't feel worthy that God could use them. But now when God did this, it was like, I want to help. I can do that. We saw the gifts of the ministry, the motivational gifts. We saw that in action. It was just like, I can do that. I can do this. And everything had to be structured so fast. It was like, you know, was, what's next? And we had to make throw cloths for all the people that started coming in after the word spread. And, uh, but Brownsville people, we would stay three and four o'clock in the morning. We would see the sun come up some mornings. Nobody wanted to leave. On the very first morning, I've got to tell you this, when my husband what came up and said, folks, get in, and all heaven came down. He went to this side of the platform, and the Lord just took him down. He was out four hours solid. He could not move, and they had to carry him out to the car, and he sent my son back in, and he said, go get your mom, and tell her we've got to be back. We'll get, it was over the first day on Father's Day at four o'clock. I mean, nobody had uh, lunch with their daddies that day, but we had <laughs> lunch with our Heavenly Father. But he said, go get, my, uh, get mom. So he said, mom, daddy's ready to go. We got to get back in two hours for church. And I said, look, I said, I don't mean to be respectful, but you tell your daddy that we have prayed two and a half years for God to show up and I'm not about to leave now. And so I was, if God was going to leave, I was going to be there to see him out the door. You know, I just, I did not want to leave that presence. It was so precious. But Holy Spirit was there in such an awesome way. And Brownsville people, they just stayed. I mean, some of these people would get up and go to their jobs at 6 and 7 o'clock and stay all night. You did not want to miss a thing. It was so awesome in those days. It was wonderful. And you know, a lot of the shaking and jerking that we saw, one preacher came and uh, I said, why don't you go down there and get prayed for, see what God will do for you. And he said, oh, I don't know about all that shaking and falling down. I'm not, I don't know about that. I said, look, I said, you probably won't fall or shake. A lot of people don't. You probably won't. Just go down there and see what God wants, will do for you. <laughs> that was the wrong thing. <laughs> He went down, Steve Hill came and prayed for him and his wife, and I mean the Lord slammed him to the ground. He shook under the power of God violently. I mean violently. And he's saying, Lord, what are you doing to me? What are you doing to me, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm taking pride out of your life. I'm taking all the junk that's been in there. And he said, that's your wife laying beside you. I want you to take your hands off of her. He said, I'm giving her an inner healing. He had always tried to make her be up front and uh, be more outgoing as uh, his wife. And the Lord just told him to leave her alone. I thought that was really neat. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're like me that you love his presence or you wouldn't be here. I don't think you came here just for another conference. I believe that you, there's a desperation in you to know the Lord and know his presence. You know, David loved his presence and he wanted to bring the ark home. In Saul's reign, he wasn't interested in the ark. He just left it. He, he just, it was at Abimelech's house. He didn't care about it. And you know, it had been in the Philistine camp seven months. And everywhere it went, it was causing trouble because God wanted to get out of there. He wanted to get back to his people. He wanted to be, his presence to be hollowed once again. And when David became king, the first order of duty was to bring the ark home because the ark was a symbol of God's presence. And David, you know, as a young boy, knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. He would sing to the Lord. And that was the very first thing on his list after he was crowned. 
Let's go get the art, boys, and bring it home. Well, Uzza and Ahio, Abinadad's grandson, they drove the ark that pulled the new cart. And David was so elated, and they were going to have a great celebration, and the musicians were there, and we were having a great time. Can't you just see them? Oh, we're taking the ark home. But all of a sudden, the ox stumbled, and Uzza reached out his hand to steady the ark, and it was, he was instantly killed, the Bible says. Now, if you'll go back in the Bible and read, it said that Uzza and Ahio, they were Abinadad's grandsons, and they played around this ark and probably went in, in the house and it was just there. It was just didn't mean anything to them. And so they might have been too familiar with the thing that was in their house. And we can do that if we take God for granted. He'll just leave and we won't even miss it. We won't even notice that his presence isn't there if we don't hollow it. When that happened, David was so angry and he was hurt at God because he wanted his presence. And it's kind of the way I felt like, God, I want you. Why don't you come? And he said, how shall I ever bring the ark home? And so he decided to send it to the home of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, Obed-Edom means worshiper. And you know, he was a converted Philistine. And for three months, he had the ark in his home. And the Bible says that everything that he had on every hand was blessed. He was blessed in his home, his children, everything he possessed just multiplied. Oh, when David heard about it, he was so jealous. I've got to bring the presence home. I've got to have the presence once again. But this time, he would find out how to bring it home. You see, there's a correct way to get God's attention and to bring his presence in. But it has to be done his way. You have to be holy. This time, the Levites would carry the ark the correct way on their shoulders with the poles like the word had told them to do. David prepared his heart. He prepared a place for this ark on Mount Zion. That's what we have to do at Brownsville. Two and a half years, we prepared our hearts, prepared a way for the entrance of our king through prayer and supplication, and he came. You have to prepare to meet your God. You can't take it flippantly when you come into his presence. There's an awesomeness about God, but the church has lost that. We know that we'll get three songs and a sermon and go home by 12 to get our roast out of the oven. Everything is predictable. And sometimes we're in such control that we know how to do church. It's too familiar. We need the expectation that God could come. And that's what built at Browns was the expectation that God, you know, if, if you don't expect him, he ain't going to come. But we didn't know how he was going to come. We just kept going after God. And he came. David wanted it in his own backyard. That's where he put it. And God says, I'll draw nigh to you if you'll draw nigh to me. You have to make a place for him. Listen what Psalms 27 says. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord, literally to inquire in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle, in the secret place of his tent. He will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. David wanted to go in that tent once again and, and, and worship the Lord. He wanted that thing so close to him. But you know, not only David loved the presence. You know who else loved the presence? Obed-Edom. He was like me. He had been touched by God. 
He saw what God wanted to do. And he loved the presence so very much. We see him showing up everywhere now. And you can get the tape and take your notes and, and go to, not now, but just go back and look at First Chronicles 15, uh, 15. Now David's preparing to bring this ark home and he's, he's appointed these men to bring this ark home. They're doing it the right way now. But he's appointed one of those men is Obed-Edom, worshiper. You see, I don't believe David would have sent people that were not sensitive to the Holy Spirit to go get that ark. After that happened with Uzzah and uh, his and Ahio, and there they were, and they maybe took it for granted, and then God killed Uzzah. He knew it had to be handled right. So I think David found men that were after his own heart. And it says in verse 18 of 15th chapter that Obed-Edom was a porter, or the Bible says a gatekeeper. And then if you'll go on down to verse 20, it says... Now we see him as in the choir. He's playing a harp. He's going to stay as close as he can to this ark, to the presence. He doesn't want to ever leave it. I believe that he was six miles away from where this tent was to be. But now he's working. He's as close as he can get. And in verse 24, it says, now he's a doorkeeper. That's pretty close. I mean, he saw who would go in and come out. He loved the presence so much. Many of our churches have never experienced the presence. It's really sad. In our colleges, they don't even believe in the Holy Spirit, some of them. I've heard, I've heard of some of the professors that just don't even believe it, but yet they're leading our children. When Moses finished all the requirements of building the tabernacle. Everything, all the furnishings were in place. Everything was ready to go. But unless the presence came, it would be useless. We've got to have the presence back in our churches, ladies. And you know, through your worship, your prayers, and your supplications, you can bring it in to your churches as you go back. You can bring it in. If God is wanted and hollowed, he can bring it in. You'll be the very one that can birth it and bring it into your church. We've got to have his presence. When the presence comes, it will change you. It'll change your church. It'll change your family. And I'm ending up. But three things I want you to remember. You must honor and respect the presence. Don't ever take it for granted that he'll always be here. You know, at Brownsville, we could take him for granted, and he could be grieved and leave. But that would be a terrible day for me. Be a terrible day, and I pray it won't. In fact, Dr. Cho said this revival would go to Jesus comes, and I, I pray that that will be what God has allowed. We hollow his presence. We get tired. But when we come in his presence, in the glory, it refreshes us. That's how we can go, like we've gone for four years. Number two, you must obey the word and live by it. Psalms 24 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who hath clean hands and a pure heart. Isaiah, I mean, Isaiah 14, 13, Lucifer said in his heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. But God says, no, you won't. I'm going to cast you down to the earth. You see, you, before you come into God's presence, you must have clean hands. Your heart must be pure because you are coming before your king, your God. Where's that coming from? Do you hear the music? It's just me. Is this heaven? 
You hear the music? Well, hallelujah, I'm going to hurry right along. I didn't know if heaven was coming down. <laughs> the devil's pride got him in trouble. And if pride can make a devil out of an archangel, what will it do for you? The Bible says, be holy for I am holy. He's a holy God, and yes, you can be holy. You won't be perfected until you get to heaven, but you can sure try. That would be my gift that I would offer to him, that I would live in an unholy generation and offer myself as a gift to him, that I won't be polluted with the world system and with all the garbage that's out there, that I would not let my eyes look at anything ugly. And I would keep my mouth and put a guard on it and, and show respect unto my husband and love him as God requires me to do. Once you get the presence, don't ever let it go. Holy Spirit today is looking for a resting place. Have you prepared a resting place for him? If you have, he will come. And I think that we have been in the presence of our king this week in an awesome way. You tasted of that this morning. But you know, as women, when the Spirit of God gets to moving like that, we don't know how to be quiet sometimes. But remember, that's when God came into my home. And I mean, it was nothing but silence and awesomeness of his presence. And words were so deep, the love between him and I, that I could not speak. I felt it, though. And it was a love language I had never known. As women, we talk too much. If you're having trouble and having a struggle in knowing God, Put your tape on, get you a good worshiping tape. Just sit in his presence. If you don't know how to pray, you don't know how to express yourself to the Lord, I thank God for the artists that have uh, wrote the songs. A lot of times I feel inadequate to be able to worship my God. But because people have been in the presence of God, they have put penned words to songs. And I can take those words and sing along with them to my king and worship him. That's what he wants. You don't have to be anything special to God. When you get in his presence, that's the most important thing. He will change your life. He will take you places you've never been. He will put you on a platform like he has me, that I have no desire to be here. I have no agenda to be here. But if he wants to use me, so be it. I just want to be used by God, whatever he chooses. If he takes it all away tomorrow, I don't care because I still have a relationship with him. And that's what I love is being in his presence, and he knows that. It's the most precious thing to feel his touch, the love, the warmth. 